now uh, we move to a question about the North Korean military. Uh, what did you ob observe about the KPA threat and the Korean People's Army troop behavior? Uh, we'll start with Sean, then go to Crate, and then to Dave. Thanks. Thanks, sir. Uh, first of all, it's, I think it's really important to note that what I'm about to say will sound positive, but doesn't really change anything about the strategic threat that North Korea poses to South Korea, to the United States. So I'm talking very tactical here. Um, when we started our engagements with the North Koreans, uh, it felt a lot like what Crate said back in the day. There seemed to be distrust, dislike, uh, and probably even a little bit of hate. And every engagement went off of a script. Uh, the, they would not go off the script. They read what they were told to read. Every engagement was audio recorded, oftentimes video recorded. Uh, basically, I think they were feeling it out. It was a lot of the same old business. But the more, like in any human interactions, the more we, time we spent together, the more we started to be able to relax and to talk about things that weren't just on the script. Um, when we removed the weapons from Panmunjom, and if you, if you don't realize that that happened, that happened in the, in the fall of 2018, there are no guns anymore in Panmunjom, no heavy weapons, no pistols. Everyone is unarmed on both sides. And as a trust building measure, uh, we inspected both sides. And on that day was when I felt there was a real breakthrough uh, because we talked about the history. We talked about Barrett Boniface. We talked about memorials. We talked about how we remember the, f the past and the fighting. Uh, and at one point, uh, we were on the North Korean side uh, in a very stark banquet room with photos of Kim Il-sung and Kim Jong-il on the walls. And a North Korean colonel came over and offered me a cigarette. And I'm not a smoker, but I also realized I couldn't pass up this opportunity. Uh, so I accepted. And we sat on a couch together and smoked a cigarette. And in some broken English, he said, Moro, do you know what I dream about? I dream about Johnny Walker and Marlboro Reds. <laughs> and in that moment, I just felt a real strong connection just between two soldiers uh, and a remote outpost. Uh, and the engagements continued like this. But there's some amazing observations that we were able to have as well. Um, General Brooks opened the door to these engagements. And then on General Abrams' first day in command, his first trip was to Panmunjom, where he gave the similar guidance. And he said, I want you to have as much commander to commander interaction as you possibly can, because that's how you de-escalate a situation. If you guys aren't talking to each other, you can't de-escalate. But I need you talking to each other. And so we pushed that issue. And what we realized one day on the North Korean side, uh, we were doing a little work, uh, actually demining together. North Koreans, South Koreans, and United States soldiers demining together in North Korea. And, and in that moment, uh, I, I mentioned, just making small talk, that President Bush had passed away. And a North Korean colonel through an interpreter said, oh, really, like, what happened? I said, well, I'll show you pictures. And I opened the internet. And his eyes got really wide and he said, is that the internet? Oh, I said, yes, God. it is. And he said, well, can you ask the internet what world leaders were there? And so we told them and they furiously start scribbling this down in a notebook. And that's when we realized that, yes, there's a small percentage of elites in Pyongyang that have access to the global internet, but most of these troops didn't and even these senior officers didn't. And so we now had information that they didn't have. And we're able to use that uh, in the, all of our ensuing engagements, for example, we showed them live feeds from the NASA Mars rover. And if you can imagine and remember, or even if you live through the U.S. landing on the moon and families just crowded around televisions watching in amazement, that's what we had. We had, we had our iPhone and we had North Koreans surrounding us watching these videos of Mars rovers and looking at the sky and saying, is that that? And we say, yes. Um, and just this access to information, it just helped break down the barriers between us. Uh, at one point though, we, re we recognized that no matter how good it was moving, no matter how much we wished each other's families well, that there was a difference. And let me explain the difference between my time in Iraq and Afghanistan and my time here. When we dealt in Iraq and Afghanistan with people who were siding with insurgents, in private moments, you could find the cracks that they weren't true believers, uh, that they were doing this for survival. I never found the crack in the loyalty of the North Koreans. Their interpersonal relationships became warm, even at times kind, but they never ever even hinted 
that their leader was wrong, that their system was not the system they wanted to be a part of, that they weren't the greatest nation on earth. There were no cracks. They are either scared or they are true believers. And I think that that's an important reminder that we still have a lot of work to do. Thanks, sir. Thank you, Sean. Uh, Creighton? Uh, the, um, they're really the threat that the North Koreans uh, uh, possessed at the, at the time, 1968. The most significant threat was an outright invasion of the North into the South. Uh, our unit uh, straddled what they used to call the bowling alley, which I guess it's a traditional uh, invasion route from north to south. And so the, the, the big um, mission was if that happened, we were to engage the enemy, try and make them deploy, and just delay them so that the bridges over the Injun River could be blown. They were mined. And if they were blown, then we would do the best we could to escape and evade back across the river and join up with our troops. So that was one of the major threats that we had to deal with. But the more common threat was really the small unit engagements uh, where we were trying to stop infiltrators or exfiltrators and just dealing with uh, North Korean reconnaissance patrols and combat patrols that they sent through the DMZ. Uh, there were a lot of North Korean snipers. It was rarely reported. I mean, we would report it back to the company, but whether, how, where it went from there, I don't know, because I couldn't find a single uh, incident in any report up higher in the chain of command where sniping was noted. Um, there are a lot of ambushes from both sides. Uh, North Korean uh, like to instigate uh, firefights between the guard posts. Uh, they had fire superiority, bigger bigger weapons than we did. Uh, so they would occasionally open up on uh, GP Gladys or, or Jane, or uh, then there were some, several pretty good firefights. Uh, North Koreans would also come across and uh, uh, put mines in. So we had to be careful about those. As far as troop behavior goes, I thought the North Korean troops were very well trained, highly motivated. And as I said before, they didn't like us at all. Uh, they excelled in small unit tactics. Uh, they were excellent in camouflage and setting up hasty ambushes. Uh, mostly they chose when and where to fight, which I thought was one of the really frustrating things. Um, they liked to use the element of surprise. Uh, they made sure they had fire superiority and they generally wanted to have, be, uh, have superior numbers. Um, I think the North Korean uh, guard posts uh, occasionally, or not occasionally, but regularly monitor where the uh, US patrols were. They, with binoculars and field scopes, could check out the general area where we were. And that left the uh, North Koreans opportunity to sneak across in a part of, the, of our area of operations where we weren't. Um, I think the North Korean guard posts also use radio contact to just basically tell them where we were and uh, avoid our, our ambushes, except occasionally they'd bump into one of them. Uh, they were a formidable enemy. Um, say they, uh, they were tough. Thanks, great. Dave? Uh, the rules of engagement that we had said that if, there were, if you saw an, an individual in the DMZ, it was not one of ours. And if that individual was not obviously uh, trying to uh, surrender or defect, we were to shoot him. Uh, and so that's where I start. Uh, the North Korean soldiers uh, were good soldiers and I uh, had a healthy respect for them I knew that if they got the chance, they would kill me. And I knew that I was supposed to kill them if I got the chance. Uh, I recently wrote uh, a David Letterman uh, type list of the 10 scaredest times I'd ever been in my life. And it seems that all 10 of them were in Korea. The last, the ninth and 10th were in the daytime and the other eight were all at night. Uh, so at night in the DMZ, it's totally black. It's dark, you can't see a thing. So you have you get to where you can rely on your, certainly your hearing, but also your sense of smell. Along those lines, I learned that when the night bird whistles got really uh, 
loud and really uh, numerous to beware. And I, I felt like that that was the North Korean soldiers uh, signaling and later confirmed that in a book by Joseph Bermudez, who wrote a book about North Korean commandos. Uh, another thing that was interesting, I learned that I could uh, smell the North Korean soldiers. Uh, I'm sure they could smell us and all of our bug repellent that we put on, uh, but I learned that I could smell them. And when the night bird whistles were numerous and when that kind of garlicky smell uh, was around, uh, I knew to be really, really uh, careful. And then all of a sudden the insects would get quiet and I knew that we, we really had a problem. So I didn't have any interaction with the North Korean soldiers other than what I just described. Thanks, Dave. I, I just wanna give, a, give my perspective a little bit in, in a different way. We, we did not have any contact uh, during the time I was on the DMZ with, uh, with the enemy forces. As I mentioned, we ran over 180 patrols uh, in my company alone without any contact. However, one way that the North Koreans uh, and ev everybody, I'm sure everybody will think of it, will, is familiar with this, is that they excellent with propaganda. I mean, we, were get, we would get leafleted on a, on a daily basis. And one specific uh, incident was when the 1st Battalion, 23rd Infantry had the DMZ mission in 1986. They had one of their Katusas defect to North Korea. And that caused quite, as you can imagine, that caused quite a stir. Uh, but we were just getting inundated with uh, leaflets. And uh, I picked up one of the leaflets and I asked my senior Katusa, uh, Sergeant Park, please uh, translate this for me. And it was, you know, it was a picture of, of the Katusa and his, all his equipment laid out on like we used to call a junk on the bunk uh, field inspection. And I asked, what's going on here with this? And he said, the KPA is asking for other Katusas to defect. And when they come, they want them to bring all their equipment. And they're especially interested in Singars, frequency hopping radio, and a set of night vision goggles. I said, oh. And I thought that was pretty sophisticated. And when I came back to, Korea three years later, I picked up uh, I picked up another leaflet that was on our camp and I looked at it and it was that same Katusa, but it's it was three it was three years later and it had a picture and I again I asked asked my senior Katusa, you know, to translate it. He said, Well that uh, that was a Katusa that defected and now he's married and he's and this is his, his son hundredth day birthday. And had a nice picture of him and his family, and they're still asking the uh, Katusa soldiers, targeting the Katusa soldiers. And I thought that was that was pretty good. You know, the, they were very sophisticated with it. Even you know later when I was stationed at Fort Bragg and worked with the psyops folks, uh, you know, it was on the same par uh, of the quality of work they did for the uh, psychological operations. So. That was uh, what I wanted to say about contact with the North Koreans.